Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. As we continue to go through the book of Matthew, if you're using one of the blue chair Bibles, it's found on page 817. But before we get to our text today, I want to talk to you about another text, and that is the book of Judges. I'm going to give a little teaser on Judges here, though I promised Kramer and Morgan O'Keefe I wouldn't preach on it until they got back from London. But the book of Judges, to completely undersell it, is an interesting book and sometimes hard to understand. But one of the best ways to understand the big picture of the book of Judges is that as you read through it, things get worse and worse. And this is particularly helpful with a guy that I think is pretty misunderstood, and that is Gideon. I take more of a pessimistic view of Gideon than some, even though he's in Hebrews chapter 11. But that's another sermon for another time. But what I want to talk about from the Gideon story is what is probably familiar to many of you of laying out the fleeces. I'm going to read to you a quick excerpt from Judges chapter 6. And again, this might be a familiar part of the story to some of you. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and on all the ground. Let there be dew. And God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and on all the ground there was dew. Now again, eventually when I preach on the story of Gideon, we'll get more into this. But I want you to notice a couple things from that because I think it'll be helpful to understanding our text today. Gideon is talking about having this physical sign of God's truth. But notice intermixed in there is Gideon saying this phrase, as you have said. At the same time, he's asking for a physical sign. When he asks for a sign, he acknowledges that God has already clearly spoken. And not only that, when he gets the miraculous sign, he asks for another one. Now again, I won't even go into the fact today, other than briefly, that the thing that actually pushes Gideon over the edge is hearing one pagan interpret another pagan's dream about bread before he finally does what God has called him to. But again, another sermon for another time. And perhaps it should not surprise us that Gideon's life ends with a tragic story of him wanting a God he could see and making an idol for the people of Israel to worship. I use the story to begin our time because at the center of our text today in Matthew are the Pharisees and the scribes, the Jewish leaders. They're going to demand a sign from Jesus. And like Gideon, they will demand a sign even though they have already seen signs of, in the miracles of Jesus and in the very words of Jesus as he has said clearly. And in one sense, he will give them one more sign, but it's not given in the way that they want. And so as we look at this passage about a demand for a sign, as we've seen other times in Matthew chapter 12, it is a text of warning. I want to warn you away from having a hardness of heart that we'll see on full display in the Pharisees and the scribes. And I also want to warn you away from a temptation to always base your faith on demands for visible signs from God. So let's look at the text. Let's begin in verses 38 and 39. Follow along as I read. <clears throat> 
Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So as we've seen before in the book of Matthew, there's another conflict between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders. And as I said, they they want a sign from Jesus. Now I think it's helpful that this is included in chapter 12 of Matthew. And when you go back and look at the context, while they may not have been you know, one minute after the next, they are grouped in a way that tell us these stories happened around the same time and in the same general area. I think that's important because this chapter, as we've seen over the last couple weeks, includes multiple references to miracles done by Jesus. So we have Jesus healing the man with the withered hand in verses 9 to 14. We have Jesus in verse 15. Matthew tells us, and many followed him and he healed them all. And then in verse 22 of chapter 12, we see that Jesus healed a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute. And while scholars tell us that there is a distinction in that day between a miracle and a sign, I think it is quite appropriate to be a little frustrated with the scribes and the Pharisees for requesting a sign when they'd seen all these miracles with their own eyes. It's as if they were saying, yes, yes, we've seen the miracles, but what we really need is a sign. Look at Jesus' response to their request. Verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, before we talk about Jonah, we'll get there, I promise. I want you to see the adjectives that Jesus uses for the people. He calls them an evil and adulterous generation. Now, Jesus uses the term generation there because, again, generally speaking, most of the people alive at the time of Jesus rejected him as the promised Savior. And here, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you are representing your generation. We also see this, that their request is not one of sincerity, but rather the bad fruit of their rejection of Jesus, which we saw back in verse 33. Contrast this demand and Jesus' response to how Jesus responded to John's disciples. First of all, in response to that question, Jesus said, look at my miracles. And then he said how they corresponded to the promises of the Old Testament. But I want to pause and look at that second adjective that Jesus uses, adulterous. He calls them an adulterous generation. I won't go into too much detail based on the various ages in the room right now, but I will say this. It is a large theme that runs throughout your Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that compares sin to adultery. In seminary, one of the projects I had was to write a paper based on a theme that ran through the Bible, and and I chose the theme of spiritual adultery, and two things stood out to me. One, just how common the language was. Language of adultery and prostitution to God. But secondly, what struck out to me was how this language is not just meant to be salacious, but rather it adds an emotional depth to our understanding of our sin against God. There's a certain weight to the idea that this picture of our sin as committing adultery against God. I think it helps us to understand the serious nature of our sin. You know, so often one of our problems is we minimize our own sin. We justify our own sin. And sometimes we need to take the antidote 
of understanding the seriousness of our sin against God. And I think this idea of adultery helps us to not only understand that in our brains, but to feel it in our hearts. That when I sin, I am committing adultery against God. But this is how Jesus describes the Pharisees' demand for a sign. That it's actually demonstrating their adulterous hearts. But he says, but you'll get one more. And that is the sign of the prophet of Jonah. So let's look at that. Look at verses 40 and 41. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus takes us back to Jonah getting swallowed by a big fish. And he said, here's your sign. Jonah, he was in the fish for three days and three nights. The Son of Man, that's, that's one of the ways that Jesus talks about himself. I'll be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. But let's talk about Jonah a little bit. God called Jonah to go and proclaim his word to the people of Nineveh. But while he was running away, God causes a great storm to disrupt his trip. And Jonah instructs the people on the boat with him to throw him into the ocean to stop God's storm. You can read that in Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1 ends this way, verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now let's say you're looking out on the water on one of our wonderful beaches or bluffs or from your house. And you see someone in the water and then you see them get swallowed by a fish or whale. If they don't pop back up immediately, which by the way, there are some videos online of people almost getting swallowed by whales. You can, not now, later. You can look that up later on the internets. But if they don't pop back up immediately, you aren't really holding out any hope for them. On top of that, in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah prays to God from the fish and uses the language of being buried and death. So in Jonah chapter 2, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. So with this picture of Jonah, Jesus compares this to his, at this point, future death and resurrection. Again, we know the end of the story. So when he says three days and three nights, we know he's talking about the death and resurrection. Jesus refuses to grant their demand on the spot by giving them some sign that they could see there as if they are able to command him to do anything. But in his grace, he offers their unbelief one more sign, the sign of his death and resurrection. Jonah seemed to be dead and was brought back to life. In the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus really died and really rose again. And Jesus continues on using the story of Jonah to call the people to the proper response of repentance and faith in him. So Jesus says that the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The people of Nineveh responded to Jonah after being in the fish for three days and his message with repentance, and these pagans, these Gentiles, will condemn the Jews of Jesus' time who would not repent, even though they were seeing someone greater than Jonah, Jesus Christ. Jonah just seemed to die. Jesus actually died and rose again. Again. 
And it's this argument that they got the lesser thing. Because again, Jonah didn't actually die. And he responded. These folks have, have the one who actually died and rose again. And yet they do not repent. The Ninevites listened to the king's messenger and repented. These guys are hearing from the king himself and refuse to repent. Why this is a helpful argument by way of Jesus, I think has a lot to do with the fact that the Ninevites were enemies of the Israelites. We see this both in the book of Jonah, but also in history. So in chapter 4 of Jonah, Jonah finally admits why he ran away. And that's as he didn't want God to show grace to the people of Nineveh. Again, we did Jonah a few years ago, and I kept calling him the best worst prophet. Or the worst best prophet, whichever one you want. But he finally admits at the end, I didn't want you to show grace to these people. But in one sense, it's a little understandable, but I think this highlights this idea that the Ninevites will be in judgment over the people who rejected Jesus. Nineveh was a big city in the nation of Assyria. Israelites who read the book of Jonah later, after its events, would connect it with Assyria's defeat of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. And historically, through the Bible and outside the Bible, we know that Nineveh had a reputation as a center of savage power. Listen to Nahum chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, never without victims. That's how Nineveh was described. We also have archaeological depictions of them impaling their enemies. If you go online, you can see a wall relief from an Assyrian palace that is on display in the British Museum that shows the Assyrians impaling their enemies. We need to see this type of reasoning as similar to what we saw back in Matthew chapter 11, where the judgment for rejecting Jesus after seeing him face to face would be worse than the pagan cities of Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. Again, this highlights what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and the scribes. That that generation of the hated Assyrians will judge you because they repented when they heard Jonah. But even when you hear the very voice of the Son of God, you refuse to repent and believe. I want to talk about that a little more in a little bit, but Jesus then offers another historical example, again, to call them to repentance. And that comes in verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The Queen of the South here is a reference to the story of the Queen of Sheba found in 1 Kings chapter 10. I won't read it, but you can read it on your own. But you see the summary of the story there, that she came from the ends of the earth, modern day Saudi Arabia and Yemen, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Again, a response of wanting to come and See God's wisdom through Solomon. And behold, someone greater than Solomon is here. This Gentile queen from the fringes of the known world came and heard Solomon's wisdom and said this. This is from 1 Kings chapter 10. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king, that you may execute justice and righteousness. 
this Gentile queen from the ends of the earth, saw all that Solomon did and said, and recognized it as a gift from the true God of the universe. In contrast, the Pharisees and the scribes have seen all that Jesus has done and all the wisdom he spoke, and they still reject him. They do not credit God. Rather, we saw earlier in Matthew, they blame Satan for Jesus' work and words. And so she will stand in judgment on that generation. We've seen time and time again in Matthew, Jesus calling the people around him, people who had the immense blessing of seeing his miracles and hearing his words straight from his face, calling them to repent and believe, and they do not. And one of the things I think this passage uniquely tells us is seeing signs is never enough. I want to read you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The demand for signs only leads to the demand for more signs. Look at the recorded miracles, hear the recorded words and wisdom of Jesus, and then see a Savior who died and rose again, so that all who place their faith in him will be forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God, and have the hope of eternal life. I can't give you a sign today, but I can show you the Christ who was crucified for your salvation. So don't harden your hearts as the Pharisees and scribes did. Who like a kid just said, oh, just one more, just one more, just one more. But rather repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ. With the time we have left, I want to talk a little bit about the next part of the passage, verses 43 and 45. And what ties this passage together is there's another reference to this generation in this part of the passage as well. But it also fits in this larger theme of unbelief. And again, I think the unique part of this is that it shows that over time, a refusal to believe gets worse and worse. Let's look at this part. I know there's some difficult details, but we'll try to work through those best we can. 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with itself seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this generation. As I mentioned, what helps us to understand some of the difficult details of this part of the passage is the repetition at the end there of this generation, tying it to the previous part of the passage. And as I mentioned previously, the whole context of this chapter and the chapters around it are warnings against unbelief mixed with stories of miracles. I think it's important to broadly see this as another warning of unbelief even when you have seen or even experienced the blessing of miracles. In writing about a parallel passage in Luke, one author helpfully writes this, emphasizing the need for response, this parable warns of the devastating consequences of experiencing God's work only to fail to follow up. Again, this fits within the broader context that the people are under harsher judgment because they've experienced Jesus in the flesh unlike other people at other times of history. The other thing that is helpful is that the reference to exorcism of an evil spirit in in verse 43 doesn't necessarily refer to an exorcism by Jesus as in 
12.27, a reference to Jewish exorcists. But even if that's not the case, there is a category of experiencing God's work, but not in a way that leads to faith in Jesus. Another author helpfully cites the story in Luke 17 where ten lepers are healed by Jesus, but only one of them returns to thank him. So when we put that all together with the details of this part of the passage, we have a person experiencing the blessing of God in the freedom from demon oppression. And the demon wanders around and returns and it finds a house cleaned up, but it's an empty house. I think it's right to understand the emptiness of the house to be a reference to the lack of faith in Jesus, even though the healing has, quote, cleaned up the person. With no one inside, the evil spirit enters with seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And the last stake of that person is worse than the first. And it's that last part of the passage that's the dire warning. It's a warning against people who have experienced, directly or indirectly, the blessings of God and his work in this world through Christ, but who still refuse to place their faith in him. Their house has been cleaned up. They have experienced, directly or indirectly, the blessings of God. But while their house is clean, it is empty and easily overtaken. Jesus is warning the people who saw with their own eyes and heard with their own ears to not persist in their rejection of him and therefore face the perfect justice of God. Even though the people in this passage had been given a blessing no one else in history ever had to see face-to-face the Son of God, their refusal to believe left them off worse than they had ever been in the first place. And that warning is still for us today. People today have not seen Jesus face-to-face, but we do have the completed work of Word of God, unlike others in history. And in light of reading and hearing the completed word of God, do not persist in your unbelief. If you do, the people of Nineveh and the the Queen of Sheba will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. And the empty house of your life will be worse than it was before. Again, we need to take the warning tone of this passage seriously. And as today is today, hear the truth of Jesus from his word. He is that promised Savior. And repent of your sins and place your trust in him. And do not persist in rejecting him as the people in his time did. A couple thoughts as we close up this morning. Number one, be careful about basing your faith on visible signs. Listen, making decisions is hard. Doing difficult things is hard. And there is a natural inclination to desire a miracle or a visible sign. And beware of that temptation. With the Gideon story, does he ask for another sign because he doesn't get the answer he wanted? Is that the same with the Pharisees and the scribes? Well, yes, yes, we've seen miracles, but we don't really want to believe in you, so now we're going to demand a sign. Sometimes we treat signs and miracles that way because God isn't giving us the answer we want to hear. Believe God in his word. Gideon even said twice as he's demanding this sign, as you have said. God has spoken clearly. Listen to Jesus through the Bible and do what you know he is calling you to do. And when you're confused, don't demand a sign. Here's some other options. Take some time to pray about it. Also, get some good advice from fellow members or the elders. That's why we're, one of the reasons we're in community is to help each other make the hard decisions and not demand that some piece of cloth be wet on the grass or then dry on the grass. Because if you're not careful, the need for a sign 
it oftentimes is never satisfying. Because a fleece full of dew doesn't speak with any more clarity than the actual words in the Bible. And so you're always going to be like, well, is that what it really means? Secondly, beware unbelief. Judgment is real. With both the example of the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba, Jesus is very clear that we are accountable to God. And one day we will have to stand before Jesus in judgment. And if you reject Jesus, you will one day have to answer for that. But the good news is that all those who repent of their sins and place their trust in Jesus have no fear of condemnation or judgment. And thirdly, beware unbelief because it only gets worse. I once heard a story, I don't know if it's real or just made up, but the story goes that there was a man who made a plan to profess faith on his deathbed. The problem is that none of us know when our lives will end or when Christ will return. So making plans of like, hey, in my last minute of life, then I'll repent, is a terrible plan. But I think the second part of our passage really speaks to the danger of procrastinating when it comes to our faith in Jesus. There's a real danger of when we refuse to believe, even when we experience the blessings of God in this life. And we need to take seriously the warning that the last state of the person is worse than the first. So don't delay. Repent of your sins today and trust in Christ today. He lived a perfect life, died and rose again as our substitute so that all who trust in him will be forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God, and have the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Father God, help our unbelief. Guard us from the temptation to demand signs and wonders from you that we would base our faith on how you have revealed yourself in Christ and through your word, that we would be quick to repent and believe, and that we would not persist in unbelief. God, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what is in your word to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.